Good afternoon. Welcome to the 65th annual meeting at the Association of the United States Army. Isn't that amazing? 65 years that we've been doing this annual meeting. But even more amazing is that this is our 20th year in doing the Military Family Forums. So that's, that's a pretty amazing record as well. I would love to say that I was here for all 20 years, but I wasn't. <laughs> and so I do want to give a shout out to the person that started all of this for AUSA, Sylvia Kidd. Many of you might remember Miss Sylvia. She was a force to be reckoned with. So I hope she's watching. Let's give her a round of applause. So my name is Patty Barron. For those of you that might not know me, I am the Director of Family Readiness at the Association of the United States Army. It's a great job. I'd like to welcome all of you here in the audience, but I also want to say hello to our um, audience that is joining us online. CONUS and OCONUS. Some of you are up very early watching, some of you are staying up late to watch, but we appreciate you being here and participating nonetheless, so thank you. Wow, has the Army been listening to you? Uh, let me just tell you that Army leadership has been listening to your voices and I couldn't be prouder of you. These next few days will feature key Army leaders discussing the issues that you have brought to their attention. Many of this, these issues were discussed at AUSA last October, some of you might remember that, and again the Senior Leaders Town Hall in February at the AUSA headquarters, um, which was live streamed by the way. We were so honored that our senior leaders um, wanted to have another uh, family forum between the ones that we do in October and that they chose to do it at the AUSA headquarters. That was really an exciting event for us. Because you trust us, we've been able to bring your comments and concerns to the folks creating the solutions, many of them in this room. The needle on, re um, on resolving them has moved and you have helped move it. We've also been able to conduct on-site forums at Fort Dix, Huntsville, Schofield Barracks, and United States Army Europe. Speaking of you, sir, a special shout out to Mrs. Cavoli, Mrs. Angela Abernathy, and to the Garrison and ACS staff and AUSA, AUSA chapter leadership at Wiesbaden, Wiesbaden Baumholder, Stuttgart, and Vilsack. I was so honored to be able to visit with them three weeks ago and, uh, and just travel throughout Germany, visiting old haunts and having some great German beer, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Thank you so much for hosting me uh, two weeks ago. It was an honor to speak with you and the Army families that shared their insights with me. So again, thank you, you sir. Slide two, please. This slide gives you a quick overview of what we do here at AUSA's Family Readiness Directorate and a short list of many of the organizations we collaborate with, such as Operation Deploy Your Dress, Wear Blue, Run to Remember, Blue Star Families, Military and Family Research Institute, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, Military Spouse Advisory Network, Tutor.com, I'm going to give you a shout out, Pam, and so many others because um, we just can't do anything by ourselves. It does take a village and it does take a team. We have also been incredibly supported by USAA and Grant Thornton, and USAA especially has allowed us to present on our on-site forums and travel across the country, so thank you. Hearing from, most, uh, from you is the most important thing we do here at AUSA, and making your voice heard in the next three days is going to be critical to increasing the qual quality of life for all of our Army families. Really, your voices matter so much. I, I can't say that enough. Slide three. So thank you for your participation. Ask questions, make comments, tweet, post, but don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag AUSA2019 and hashtag AUSA family. For those of you in the room, we have a question card at each of your tables. When a speaker inspires a question from you, jot it down and then wave it high in the air and our, our card runners will pick them up. For those of you online, uh, ask your questions on our Facebook feed. Uh, please identify your location so that we can give you a shout out before we ask the question. And do me a favor and share, share, share. Let people know that you're watching this. Tell them that they should be watching it too. The more Army families we get to participate in these forums, the better off we are. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're always so grateful to our forum sponsors and their sponsorship allows us to bring in quality speakers and provides us with the resources to do what we do. So thank you, GEICO, for your sponsorship of for Family Forum 1. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Trail. Uh, Dr. Trail is a behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. His research focuses on how stress affects relationship processes and health outcomes among military and civilian couples and the effectiveness of programs in uh, mitigating family stress 
uh, and family stress. Current research projects include the Today's Army Spouse Survey, assessing the needs of Army spouses and their families, and he is here today to present his findings. Please give a warm applause to Dr. Trail. Thank you. Good afternoon, or morning, or evening, depending on where you're at. Um, it's my pleasure to speak with you today about some research I've been doing uh, with Dr. Kara Sims, uh, my colleague at RAND, uh, really looking at how, how Army fa spouses face their challenges in life and how they go about solving those challenges. So this research was supported through the Office of Def Deputy Chief of Staff, G9, uh, and conducted through the RAND Arroyo Center. And I'm going to see if I can change this. No? Can you do the second slide? Thank you. So this work builds off of prior research we've been doing at RAND, looking at soldier and family quality of life issues. And you may remember two years ago, uh, Dr. Sims presented some research we had done with soldiers, looking at their perspective on family needs. Um, but being soldiers, they mostly talked about themselves. They didn't talk so much about their families and what their families need. So this research that we're doing today that I'm going to present, if you the next slide, uh, puts a focus squarely on spouses. So in this study uh, we conducted in 2018, we surveyed a representative sample of Army spouses whose soldiers were stationed Oconus. Uh, we had over 8,000 respondents to the survey. And we asked them to complete really a unique comprehensive survey to understand the challenges they face and how they've been trying to address those challenges. So if you're online, uh, the survey is downloadable from RAND's website. If you're here, there's copies over there, including some shorter versions of it. Don't get up now because you'll miss part of my talk. Uh, next slide. So this survey is unique in a way because it explores the process by which spouses go about solving their problems. So it really starts out with the most significant problems that spouses face. Uh, according to them, in the past year, what sort of problems they had faced. Then it walks through the types of help they needed to help address those problems, whether they were able to access the help they needed and resolve their problems, and then what are the consequences of being able to resolve those problems versus having unmet needs. Um, and the survey as a whole evaluates whether spouses successfully navigate the resource landscape, figure out where to go to get the help they need, uh, and, and then are able to solve their problems. Um, it also helps identify potentially vulnerable populations of spouses who might need additional help or additional outreach. So next slide. So a little bit about this survey. What makes it different in a way is that most surveys start with the program uh, use and then measure whether or not the program helped the person or not or whether they were satisfied with the program. Um, this survey takes a step back and really starts with the problem that spouses are experiencing and walks them through the problem solving process. So it picks up on spouses who uh, use the more, more than one resource, for example, to help solve their problem, or who actually don't even use a program or a service to help them with their problem. Um, because of that, if a spouse is using a program for help, so if they're using um, childcare and childcare is working for them, then they don't have a problem with childcare, so they don't actually show up in the survey. Um, at the same time, if you could have the best program in the world, but if spouses can't find their way to that program and access it and use it, uh, then they're not going to receive the help they need. So as a aside for that, if you run a program or, or, or work uh, in a program office or you conduct a service for, for military families, uh, this is not a program uh, evaluation per se, uh, because it really just is a needs assessment and whether the resources that are available match, match what spouses need and whether spouses are able to navigate their way to those resources. So next slide. So a quick overview of results, um, and I'll explain some of these terms as we go through the, the presentation. Um, so for problem areas, the top problem areas that were reported by spouses were with work-life balance, military practices and culture, and spouses' own well-being. Um, when we asked about how severe the problems they were facing were, relationship problems were rated as the most severe, followed by problems with their child's well-being. For types of help needed, the top type of help needed was emotional and social support. So for resources, most spouses contacted military or civilian resources for help, and most were able to resolve their problems, but 22% or one in five had one or more unmet needs. Um, 
for the spouses as a whole, uh, many uh, lacked knowledge about the resources that are available to them and how to navigate that system. Um, and spouses of junior enlisted soldiers, those who were unemployed and looking for work, and spouses who lived further from post were particularly vulnerable across a number of different measures. So next slide. So first, looking at challenges. So what types of challenges did spouses experience in the past year? So we had a list of 96 potential challenges that spouses could check off. Uh, and if none of those 96 different types of challenges fit what they experienced, they could write in their own uh, response to that. And those were grouped into nine different problem domains, which I'll talk about a little more as we go through. Um, if they checked um, different challenges in more than two problem domains, they, we asked them to choose their top two problems. So it's really about the problems that they face that are the most significant for them, not necessarily just everything they, they encountered in the past year. Uh, and then for the top two problems, we asked them to um, rate the severity of those problems. So as you'll see from the, the slide here, about 5% of spouses actually reported that they didn't have any problems. They didn't check off any of our 96 issues. They didn't write in anything. Uh, and we asked to confirm, like, are you sure you don't have any problems? And they confirmed yes. So 5% of spouses did not experience any problems in the past year. But among those who did, next slide, um, feeling stressed, overwhelmed, or tired, both within their own well-being domain and within their soldiers. So they reported that. They were feeling stressed, overwhelmed, and tired about 56% of the time, and 50% uh, of them reported that their soldiers were feeling uh, stressed, overwhelmed, and tired. Uh, the next most frequent one was uh, feeling lonely or bored and their own well-being. Uh, the next one was mood changes or experiencing relationship problems, specifically communication challenges in the relationship. And importantly, um, another fairly frequent issue that spouses reported was difficulty in figuring out how to use the military system, how to find out about resources and where to go for help. And this is a theme that actually came up quite a bit in the survey, and we'll talk a little bit more as we go through. Really wanting help, but not knowing where to go or how to get that help. Next slide. So looking at the problem domains, the ones that they chose as their top two um, most significant problems. The second ones were work-life balance, military practices and culture, and their own well-being, followed by relationship problems and problems with the healthcare system. You know, getting the appointments on time, finding a doctor that takes TRICARE, that sort of stuff. Next slide. But of course, frequency isn't the only important dimension. Um, when you think about uh, less frequent problems, they can also be more severe. Uh, so we asked them to rate the severity of their problems along several different dimensions. And the most severe are the problem that had the highest severity ratings were relationship problems, like I mentioned earlier, followed by child well-being, financial or legal problems, soldiers' well-being, and their own well-being. Next slide. So, spouses who had problems, we asked uh, the type of help that they needed to deal with those problems. So do you need information? Do you need social support? Do you need cash? What do you need to help you with this problem? Uh, if they chose, again, more than two different types of needs, we asked them to rate uh, their two most significant needs for the problem. And overall, about uh, among all spouses, 17% said they had a problem, but they did not have a need. Again, we asked a follow-up question. So why didn't you have any needs? Um, what, was, what, what was going on with your problem that you did not report any needs for it? And about 65% said that they, um, that they had no needs because they had already solved the problem themselves or were in the process of solving the problem themselves. So they were actually just working on it themselves. So they didn't need outside support necessarily. So that's 65% of that 17%. Next slide. So of those who did report needs, um, the overwhelming response, not overwhelming, but most said that they uh, needed emotional or social support. So about a third of spouses um, reported that as a need, followed by activities, professional counseling, and general information. 
Um, at the bottom there, you'll see we did ask them if they had a need that didn't fit our categories to, that they could write in uh, what they, they needed. And we coded those into different categories. So some of those show up at the bottom there. So like about 8% said they needed better service or availability or quality in the programs they were using. 3% uh, wanted to change the military practices or rules. Next slide. Okay, so following the flow of the survey. So you have problems, you have a need. Do you access resources to meet those needs? Um, so about 8% of spouses actually said, you know, they had a problem, they had a need uh, for that problem, but they did not access a service or a program or even talk to other people about what, the, um, what they needed. And, we asked again a follow-up question, well, why not? Why didn't you reach out to resources? And the most common response among those who did not reach out was that they did not know who to contact for help. So about a third of those who you know, had a need had, um, and did not reach out for resources said they just didn't know who to contact. Next slide. So of those who did use resources, um, it's on a number of resources, both military and non-military. So I'll go through what some of those specific resources are in the next slide. Um, but about 71% access both military and civilian services uh, to help them with their problems. About 15% sought only military resources or civilian only resources. Um, and on average, spouses, spouses contacted more than four resources per problem that they experienced. So they didn't just go to one place if they had a problem to help solve it. They went to four different um, sources for help. So next slide um, shows you what some of those sources were and what were most frequently reported. So personal networks, so family or friends, um, was the most often used resource um, by spouses. So those are percentages in the, the numbers there, 52% said they reached out to their personal networks. 43% uh, said they reached out to other military spouses for help. Um, and then 43% said they saw a military provider, medical provider for help. Um, internet was also very popular, not surprisingly. Uh, both civilian and uh, military internet and social media were also somewhat frequent uh, sources of help for people. Um, and I just want to point out that the Army Family Readiness Groups uh, are down there at the bottom of the military resources. Um, they were not accessed very frequently uh, by, um, by spouses for their help. Um, and I just want to point out, again, just as a reminder because of the flow of the survey, this is not a percent of spouses who use each of these resources. So if you, you think about child and youth services, for example, 16%, um, more than 16% of spouses use child and youth services, right? This is the percent of spouses who use these different um, resources for a problem that they had. Just, so just in case you were tracking on that. Next slide. Okay, so next we asked spouses who used resources, well, did those resources provide them with the help they needed? Next slide. So of those who used resources, the majority of spouses had their needs met. However, some did not. Um, across all spouses, including those with no problems, you know, no needs, et cetera, that works out to about 22% of spouses, or one in five, who reported having one or more unmet needs. So we asked them across all the resources they went to, were those needs met? They said they were not. Next slide. So what are the implications of that? Um, sometimes when you do research, you find a finding, you're like, well, what does that really matter? Well, we uh, did some uh, regressions that related the different types of problem solving that spouses went to. So, you know, those who use resources and had their problems solved, uh, those who uh, didn't use resources, those who had no problems, et cetera. And compared to those groups, those spouses who had unmet needs had higher levels of stress, reported worse attitudes towards the military, and expressed less support for their soldiers staying in the military. So next slide. So stepping back, uh, we meant, I mentioned earlier that one issue that came up fairly frequently is being able to navigate the system. Um, so we asked spouses about their knowledge of the system and how they, confident they felt about sort of figuring out which resources to go to when they were having problems. And most spouses agreed that they were comfortable using military resources, so about 57%. 
uh, so they were comfortable, but many spouses faced a challenging navigating those resources. So around 40% said they didn't know who to contact to find the right military resources to meet their need. Um, and this is in general. This is not for the problems we asked about. This is just across all, all problems they've had. Uh, and about 34% said they did not know to con who to contact if a resource was not meeting their needs. So if they went to a program to get help and it wasn't helping them, they didn't really know what to do after that. Um, interestingly, spouses with dependent children found it easier to access and to navigate military resources. And what we're thinking there is that it's possible that having children sort of puts you in connection with the military community. So you're, you're using CYS, for example, so you're connected to those resources, you have experience with them, so you might be able to use the system better, you might be able to talk to other spouses who have children, for example, about your problems, they might help you. Next slide. But there were some groups of spouses that were particularly vulnerable. So soldiers, uh, spouses of uh, junior enlisted soldiers, so that's E1s to E4s, uh, were more likely to report financial, financial or legal problems, uh, need general information, uh, less likely to reach out to other Army spouses for help, and less knowledgeable about navigating the system. Um, spouses who lived further from post uh, were also vulnerable across a number of measures. Uh, including they were less comfortable using uh, the resources available to them, less able to navigate them, and more likely to have unmet needs. And finally, spouses who were unemployed and looking for work specifically um, had more unmet needs, are more likely to have unmet needs, and also experienced some vulnerabilities across a number of different measures. Next slide. Um, so, Spouses needed information, or they in indicated they, they wanted information about how to access resources and what resources are available. So we asked them um, how best to get information to them. Uh, about 61% said they would like a mailed postcard. Now, we mailed postcards to spouses for the survey. That's how we got in contact with them. Um, so it's possible they were just saying, hey, it works for me. Um, but it's not a bad you know, a way to get people's attention. Um, Facebook um, was cited by 54% of spouses as a good way to contact them, and an email announcement from a unit leader or from a family readiness group, about 45% of spouses said that, which is kind of interesting since only about 15% of spouses said they used family readiness groups to help them. Uh, they were more willing to be contacted through that email by those groups. Next slide. So some implications. Um, most spouses were able to resolve their problems, uh, but the process of seeking help for a problem through military and non-military resources doesn't always work well for spouses. Um, but social connections are very important for spouses. Social support was a top need, and most spouses reached out to other military spouses or to friends or family for help. Um, there's a lack of knowledge on how to navigate the system, though. Um, and when a program is not working for a spouse and a lack of awareness of programs. And, you know, it could be that if you had an unmet need um, through using a program, it could be that another program actually would have helped you, but if you couldn't get to that program, you didn't know about it, um, then, you know, you're not going to receive the help you need. Uh, and importantly, spouses of junior enlisted soldiers, those who lived farther from post, and unemployed spouses who were looking for work were also the most vulnerable groups. Next slide. So some recommendations. Um, so one recommendation tied to this need for social support and social connections is to boost the effectiveness of and participation in family readiness groups. Um, now, we know that family readiness groups have a bad reputation. Uh, we hear it all the time when we talk to spouses. Um, but they are a source of social support and of information for spouses. Um, and we realize that, you know, Increasing usage of, of those family readiness groups would require a reboot of the whole process of a whole, the whole program. Uh, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that, I think, in the next panel. They're going to talk about some changes that are being made. Um, another recommendation is that FRGs or other solutions could better connect vulnerable groups to the military community. So getting those vulnerable groups, junior enlisted, spouses of junior enlisted soldiers, spouses who live further from post, um, more involved in the military community could really help them find the resources they need. Um, we also think that uh, to, to improve the inflammation flow to spouses, um, we think that, spouse, that the Army should explore providing 
uh, outreach to uh, spouses and connecting them through email, either through uh, collecting their emails and being able to email them uh, information or is actually issuing them email addresses. Also, helplines or no run door policies are good tools for negotiating resources. So you can call a helpline if you don't know where to go. So there's military one source, of course, but there could be other helplines or going to uh, I mean, ACS for help. Um, a no wrong door policy means if you show up at the physician with a problem that is better handled by a different um, a program uh, like ACS or maybe you need financial help, uh, that physician's office could actually point you to the, uh, the resources that are most appropriate for you. And finally, to uh, build customer, re customer feedback and ongoing program evaluation and monitoring into the program. So if programs are not working for spouses, then you know, this being able to let them communicate to programs that it's not working and why it's not working and why they're not able to use it would really help improve the program's um, ability to help spouses solve their problems. So that's it. Next slide, I think is the last one. And uh, any questions? Yes. It was active duty spouses only. Yes, thank you. Way back in the back. Do you have any recommendations about connecting via social media? So, yes. Um, you know, not everybody's on social media, right? Um, Facebook seemed to be the most popular one. We asked about other types of social media, and it, they were not, um, at least not recommended as much by the spouses that we, uh, that we surveyed. Um, so, I mean, the problem with social media is it's kind of a uncharted territory sometimes when you get a bunch of spouses together. So there's, mo um, I would say, moderated groups would probably be better. Um, than sort of unmoderated groups. Um, I found other, in other research that that's the case. Um, so, and then it's a matter of getting people to sign up for it and them finding out about it, which I think is the same issue, right? It's sort of like, okay, there's a Facebook group out there for say military spouses at this installation. How do the spouses at the installation find out about it if they're not already connected to the system? And I think that's the hard part about that. One of the things that we're trying to do, and I'm at Fort Eustis with mm -hmm. MWR, is because we're finding most of our success with social media, mm -hmm. especially with the um, lower enlisted, mm -hmm. and is to try as when they're in processing to get the spouses to actually give us, you know, access to their their spouses' um, social media pages, mm -hmm. because that, especially those who live remotely, that seems to be where we are finding our most success. Is that if you send me, and I'm 54, if you send me an email, I'm not going to read it, but if you text me or message me through Facebook or any of my social mm -hmm. media sites, I'm going to see it. That's perfect. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's getting that contact right off the bat that you're doing. I think that's a really great idea. Hello. Hi. Of the 22% of unmet needs, can you go into further detail of what those were? So the, so there's a couple of different things. One is that um, for the problem categories, um, problems with your own well-being were one of the lowest rates of unmet needs, which is kind of interesting. So, and I think that's likely because, um, you know, if you're having a healthcare problem or if you're having a um, psychological problem or something like that, you kind of know where to go. You know, if you're having a healthcare problem, you go to a physician. If you're having a psychological problem, you go to a psychologist. Um, so those are actually lower. Uh, other than that, other than most of the categories were pretty similar. Um, and for the needs, the, the, the highest rate of unmet needs was for an advocate. Now, not many people said they needed an advocate, someone to like sort of help them and represent them uh, in helping them solve their problem. Um, but that was the highest rate of unmet needs was someone to be an advocate for them. Anything else? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Trail, and please accept this little gift of, uh, to as a token of appreciation from AUSA Family Readiness. And I think Yvonne is over there. Uh, I'm really excited. It's coffee. <laughs> so I think we might 
uh, all needed a little bit. So thank you again. That was really very, very informative. Um, okay, everyone, I, I forgot to mention that uh, this is going to be our longest forum of the next few days. And so I'm going to ask you all to just um, take your breaks as needed. But right now, I'm going to ask you to stand up and take a stretch break as we bring up our panelists, but don't go anywhere. And so our, our first panel will be coming up on stage. And bring, bring your panel. Nice light right there, huh? Yeah, it is. Right in our face. That's okay. It's a quick break in it. It's always, it's always risky. Okay, everyone. That was your break. <laughs> Everybody come on back and sit down. Okay, you're not going to want to miss this panel. For sure. So thank you. Thank you for that. So this, uh, our first panel is going to be moderated by someone you all know very well, Lieutenant General Patricia Jorjo, who is a United States Army retired. <laughs> As as you know, General Jorjo retired as the 43rd Army Surgeon General in 2016. She was the first woman and nurse to hold that position. She now serves as Chief Executive Officer for Op OptumServe, which supports the health needs of federal agencies serving the military and veterans. Lieutenant General Jorjo is also an AUSA Senior Fellow and is here in that capacity. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend, Patty Jorjo. Afternoon, everyone, and it's wonderful being back here. So I want to first um, thank you, Dr. Trail, for the insights that you shared, and then more importantly, for the great work that Rand has done so over so many years. So thank you, and let's give a big round of applause. So when I was listening to the results of the research that was done, I kind of categorized it in my mind under um, six C's. And so the first one would be connection, compassion, communication, commitment, coordination, and concern. And when I was listening to that, it really kind of fell in one of those six categories. And so I thought, as we listen to the panelists, part of the questions that I'll ask will kind of center around one of those. But it really is, I think, our opportunities um, to look and say, how do we take all of those together and weave them into a fabric of support for all of our service members and their families that are serving this great nation and abroad. And looking at it, how we weave it in person or we weave it through a digital capability that allows that robust support system. And so we're very honored today because I think we have three outstanding panelists that are gonna share their insights with us today. And so the first panelist that we have is Colonel Steve Lewis who's the Family Program Branch um, Manager and works for the Department of the Army, Army Family Advocacy Program Manager, and then the Office of AXM. And so I've seen his great work over the years, and we're very, very happy and pleased to have you today. So thank you. And then we have Rob McCartney, who's the Executive Director of the Barry Robinson Center in New York, I mean, Norfolk, Virginia. And it's a, a residential center for long-term treatment for our military children and their family, uh, the adolescents. And I think what's so important about the work that he's been doing is that he's got so many that are veterans, so it's, it's really those that understand and serve are serving back and giving back to our military children. And then Patty Barron, who I think needs no you know, introduction at all and does so much, um, both when her husband Mike was serving on active duty 
and then she's continued to serve. And so she is the director of our family readiness at AUSA. So what I'd like to do is start with Steve, and I'm gonna ask just for a couple minutes um, for some opening remarks, and then at the end of yours, if you could share what you are most proud of. Great. Thank, thank you, General Jorjo and uh, Patty again. I, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be up here at uh, AUSA, uh, Family Forum One especially, uh, to, to have an opportunity to really talk about um, you know, our great, strong, and resilient Army families. I mean, this is a great opportunity to talk about this. Um, and I and at, at family programs and, and now the new uh, G9. So we're no longer XM ma'am, but oh, we, we, it's okay. Hey, we are new G9. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We changed, ma'am, in between our first meeting. But um, you know, <laughs> here it, and it, it'll be changed at the end of this meeting. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Hopefully not. Uh, but uh, you know, at, at, in family programs, we really do appreciate the tremendous work that agencies like the RAND and other research agencies do in both helping us understand and 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 get 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 better knowledge in in what the challenges that are facing Army families, but also giving us some insight into the ways with which we in, in family programs and headquarters DA can uh, begin to address those challenges and 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 put in place. Uh, uh, mechanisms or supports to uh, to really help them, and so I, I'm really proud to be able to be part of that system and part of that that team. Uh, and a lot of our team is here today that is is focused on families. Um, and 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 if I if I've got a few things to say, I want to start out by saying, you know, the the thing that really continues to come up is this idea of social uh, social support and connectedness, and and really what a strong predictor it is for resilience for Army families. Um, we saw that last year in last year's AUSA forum as well as again today. Social support and connectedness are, are critical for family readiness. And uh, we, we recognize, and I think, and really, I, the our Army leaders have recognized that. And that's why they put forth some recent policy changes that focused on connection and communication within our soldier and family readiness groups. And uh, so, what, so what does this look like, right? We're talking about there's a change in soldier and family readiness groups, and what does it look like? And, and, and um, I want to just really pull on one of those, those findings that uh, Dr. Trail spoke about today. As he described it, junior enlisted members as well as family members that are living furthest away from installations continue to report feelings of, of boredom, isolation, and stress. And... Um, and it's really interesting because when you think about it, I mean, nearly 70% or correction, of, of that age group, 18 to 24 year olds, they spend up to 70% of their time on social media apps, up to three hours a day. So they are connected already, right? But they're tethered to sort of the family and, and friends that they had before they came into the Army. So they're connected to them, they're, they're hearing about all the things going on, and that just further exacerbates that feeling of loneliness and, and isolation. And so we recognize that the soldier and family readiness group, as we make this shift from uh, a spouse group or a spouse program to a commander's program for soldier and family readiness, we want to be able to tether those people away from, not, not just tether them away from those family and friends that they had in their original network, but really tether them into our Army family and our Army community so that we can be available to support them and to provide them the resources and assistance they need. We recognize that the, the, when we, we put together the uh, Soldier and Family Readiness Group policy, we really saw it had, had three sort of overarching objectives associated with that. The first big objective was we wanted to keep it simple and flexible, put it in the commander's hands to be able to shape the Soldier and Family Readiness Group into what they think the soldiers and families need and what they recognize the soldiers and families need and ease many of the reporting restriction requirements. And we did that with the SFRG policy. We also wanted to make connection and communication a core task you know, commanders do this every single day when they're building lethal combat teams. They're communicating what the mission is and how we're going to get at it and how we're going to continue to build those lethal teams. We just look at the commanders and say, use those same skills, those same uh, activities they do to build lethal combat teams to continue to build that, uh, you know, outside their immediate formation and build the families and the soldiers and pulling them all together into one large uh, fighting construct to be able to support the soldier when they need it the most. And then we also went ahead and we looked at the policy and said, who really needs to lead the soldier and family readiness group? And we said, commanders need to lead that soldier and family readiness group. They need to be able to link all of these family members in, in the unit and the soldiers in the unit into one and be able to continue to communicate with them and connect them uh, to the uh, services and support that's available. And as long as the, those three elements are in place, we've got a strong, viable soldier and family readiness group. 
Now, over in uh, G9 and family programs, we continue to recognize that this is just the beginning of the work and the beginning of the shift. The shift sometimes away from a, a sort of a, uh, a, a spouse program, but to shift to a, a unit program that's focused on soldiers and families, that brings together a lot of great information and resources, uh, but also ensures that we, we, we give the commanders the tools they need so that they can um, continue to link those soldiers and families to those available resources. So this is an iterative process. We're working with uh, our stakeholders and other organizations to uh, and other entities within the Army to continue to build what is Soldier and Family Readiness Group, take it away from just a, a fundraising entity to something that is, 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 is really connecting people, using all the resources available to them, whether it's social media, whether it's uh, email, and, and, and using that as a way to link them. So we're, we're excited about it. We continue to work with our stakeholders in, in pulling this information together. And we're open to hearing your ideas and your thoughts as well, because we recognize we want to make this soldier and family readiness group truly something that commanders can leverage within their kit bag of building strong, lethal combat uh, formations. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, I think I was supposed to share my most proud thing, yes. right? Thank you, ma'am. So I've got a few minutes. I, I got my stop earlier, ago, so I'll try to be brief. But uh, I think my mom was going to dial in today and watch us on Facebook. So if my mom's out there, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of my mother. She uh, raised myself and my brothers and sisters uh, pretty much by, herse by herself and uh, battled cancer twice mm -hmm. and continued to do that. And uh, today at 83, three years old almost. She continues to be strong and uh, is, is my biggest supporter. So mom, thank you for supporting me and I'm very proud of you, mom, thank you. Okay, let's give mom a big round. And Rob, why don't you share yours? Hi, I'm Rob McCartney. Uh, the Barry Robinson Center. Uh, we're a nonprofit residential treatment center for kids six to 17 that have a military connection. So what does that mean? And what does that mean to this group today? Uh, let me shift a little bit and say that you're a parent of a child who's been recently diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. Think of yourself in that place as that parent. Some of us have been there. What do we do at that point? Where do we send our child for treatment? How do we know it's the best treatment? Who do we trust to make that recommendation? Then switch over and think that you're the parent of a child who's had their second, maybe the third, acute psychiatric hospitalization. Maybe a suicide attempt, maybe self-injurious behavior, maybe they're just having trouble with mood dysregulation, but struggling. Maybe they're responding to dad's deployment, maybe they're responding to mom's depression secondary to that deployment. Maybe they're responding to the PTSD that dad brings home or mom brings home. Maybe they're responding to that this is their third psychiatric uh, hospitalization and maybe their sixth school that they've attended. But for whatever reason, something has broke. And they're now telling you your child is in need of residential treatment center. Think about that. Now your child has to go someplace, spend the night, be away from you, this child who you've loved, right, and taken care of and you don't know what to do and where to go. And you've heard horror stories about residential treatment centers. Kids get hurt, kids learn bad, bad things. The Barry Robinson Center is not like that. The Barry Robinson Center, seven years ago, we became a TRICARE provider. And four years ago, we decided we were gonna go all in on working with military-connected families and their children. And with that, we've done it on a campus. Um, why don't you hit the... The slide, got to remember technology, right? Um, the fact that we've done it on a campus that's an open campus. We don't take kids who are highly aggressive. We're not going to take kids that are going to be uh, sexually threatening somebody. We have a high ratio of therapists. But one of the best things we have is that we offer the military family an understanding of what they go through. I was reminded the other day when I was working with the family that when you know one military family, you know one military family. And so we bring that sort of uniqueness as well to that, to understand that um, every family is different, but there are some similarities and some understanding. What does it mean to a special ops sergeant's career when all of a sudden maybe the, there's been a divorce and he has custody of his child and his child is in need of 
uh, hospitalization and residential care. How do we facilitate that? How do we ensure the fact the child gets help and also dad can continue serving? What if it gets to the point where there's actually a need for dad to separate and having to come up with that decision to make that for his family? It can be tough. Tough both for his career and tough for a financial situation. So we help with that. What if you're gonna make the decision and our program is in Norfolk, Virginia, and you want treatment with us and yet you live in the state of Washington? In your package, you have a briefing for us and it shows that we've taken children from over 40 states and six different countries serving over 500 military families. We help to ensure the fact that transportation, the cost of housing when they're with us, does not get in the way of treatment. One of the benefits of working for a nonprofit that is supported by a, uh, a very strong board and understand what our mission is, is just to be able to help serve the families and the children who are serving as well. Um, you know, when you're, you're talking about the six C's, I was only able to catch up five of them, writing them down, a little too slow. Um, but I think the whole issue about connection and compassion is something that we do really well. Uh, if somebody calls us for information, I have as part of my team out there, uh, Justin and Lisa, raise your hands, wave your hands. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Brooks is here or not. Um, but they have uh, expectation from me that when a call comes in, it's responded to within two hours. And the expectation is we have a disposition done within 48 hours. Uh, families don't want to wait under stress. Uh, sometimes not that quick. We had a referral recently from Germany that took us a minute to uh, try to figure out custody and how we were going to bring the child in and who was going to pick them up at the airport. And if I needed to somebody to send somebody over to Germany to come back with that child. Um, the other thing that we do great is we don't take everybody because we know we can't meet every kid's needs. Can't be everything to everybody. Um, and so when you call, we will, uh, if it's not us, we help find that. Um, we're sort of that one-stop shopping. And I've got my stop sign here. These guys are great up here. Um, uh, what I'm most proud of, uh, we're asked with that, well, I'm really proud at this stage of my life to be the, the leader of this organization. Uh, didn't think in my career this is where I would end up. Um, it's been a pretty phenomenal ride the last seven years. Uh, part of this pride has been driven by my pride for my son-in-law, who is a 100% disabled Marine. Uh, one of the reasons why I took the job was to be close to them and to be able to help out with my grandkids and to make sure there was a program if my grandkids ever needed um, this level of care I'd sleep at night. So that goes with that proud for uh, uh, my son-in-law, Greg, uh, who's doing well, getting ready to get his first dog. Uh, Patty, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, I also will tell you that we're down the family forum, booth 3324. Um, please come by and, uh, and talk with my team there. Uh, we'll be here afterwards, need to talk to. I know often when people have questions, they like to do it in private, and we can do that as well. Uh, again, thank you very much, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Rob. And then, Patty, if you can give us from the personal family perspective. Absolutely. Um, as you can see, I am not the beautiful Maria Reed, uh, who was going to be in, um, in this spot today. Uh, Maria is living the Army life, of course, and her husband currently deployed. Her son was playing football on Friday. He received a very hard hit. He has a concussion, and she needed to stay with him. And so uh, that is why I'm sitting in for Maria. Maria is the Army Spouse of the Year, uh, the Armed, Service, um, Armed Forces Insurance Army Spouse of the Year. And, uh, and I had the very big honor of being one of the judges for the MSOI program this year. I read hundreds of, of nominations. And Maria stood out to me because um, she has a very um, atypical and yet typical Army story in that she was a producer of, of commercials and, and was in the film industry for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And then you know what happened? She fell in love with a soldier and uh, tried very hard to continue her career while, while um, after they got married and found that it was really, really difficult. So what she decided to do was stop, stop her career, although it was very hard for her to do that, and she decided to go into teaching. And she taught for nine years. She's very, very good at with um, IT and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, internet and those types of things. 
uh, but after uh, doing things for nine years, she realized that she really missed uh, the opportunity to, to be a part of, 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 of filmmaking. And she and her husband um, together, because she said, we don't do anything without each other. You know, we consult each other on, on the things that we want to do. Um, she said, I'd like to start a TV channel. Okay, sure. <laughs> start a TV channel. And that's exactly what she did. She started a channel called Moving with the Military. I don't know if any of you have seen it or heard it. But Moving with the Military was Maria's um, wonderful um, uh, pro project where she uh, taught army spouse, what she wanted to do is she wanted to tell the army spouse, the army family story. And she didn't feel that if you were to go on TV uh, necessarily you would get the, the accurate one. So she wanted to tell it herself from her perspective. And uh, she, and she decided to do it in a fun way by decorating on a dime. You know, how many sets of curtains can you have and what can you do with them? We've all, <laughs> we've all been there. Uh, how, how Do it yourself projects, uh, doing lots of different kinds of things. And through that she found that she was really building an audience because people military spouses they wanted to be connected and being connected in fun things like decorating your home and getting tips on that was a, was a way to um, to kind of live our life together and yet at the same time do it individually because everybody decorates a little bit differently uh, what she ended up finding was that uh, through this TV program that she had uh, she was starting to connect with an awful lot of military spouses who, who wanted to help they wanted to be involved somehow and so they started doing things um, where they would go to to a military uh, family's home and they would renovate a room, a kind of a surprise, you know, renovation of some kind. And she said, although it was wonderful for the family that got that renovation, where it was truly wonderful was the volunteers that helped, the volunteers that came out of the woodwork and say, I want to be a part of this project. And through that, she built community. And I think that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the RAND um, study shows us that, uh, that, that not being connected is probably our worst enemy. And she found a way to connect people that wouldn't usually want to be involved in something. So kudos to her. When, um, when she sent me some notes, she said that if she were to look at where the challenges were for military spouses, they really do align very much with, with what we've heard so far. Uh, one of them being isolation. And, and, and when I was reading all these MSOI nominations, the one thing that stood out to me was that every single one of them said, somebody came up to me, physically came up to me, and grabbed my hand and said, come with me, I want you to join me. I want you to, this is, a, this is AFTV, or this is the, the Spouses Club, or we're going to go play bingo, or we have, you know, a, 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 what is it, Stroller Warriors, and it's a lot of fun. Whatever it was, somebody took the time to see another spouse who looked like they might need a friend, and they grabbed them by the hand and they said, come with me. That's very, very important. The other thing that she uh, wanted to mention was housing. And how, yes, many, many of our families, over 70% of our families live off post, but that's a very isolating place to be sometimes. Although the civilian neighborhoods are great, you could have you know, some really, really good homes. Um, not that we don't have them on post, because we do, but you know, we have our challenges, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that later. But, um, but, but kind of being that military family off post, you really need that contact on post. And what the study has shown is that those families are, the, are very vulnerable when they're living off the military installation. So how do you get them to connect? She talked about childcare. Yes, childcare is an issue, and we, when we think about childcare, we think about very young children. But here is a, is a mom who's a professional, who has her own business, who has to travel sometimes in order to help her business grow, but when she can't find people to take care of her children, what is she going to do? And then uh, she definitely talked about unemployment or um, not being employed as well as you could be as being an issue that is a challenge. So um, my, I wish Maria was here. She could have um, more eloquently shared her story with you than I did. And I would tell you that the one thing I'm proud of is I'm really proud of the currently serving spouses that we have right now. They are unbelievable. They are amazing. They are resilient. And sometimes they hurt. But they try very hard to find the place where they can get their needs met, and if they can't find it, it's up to those of us that kind of know how to navigate the system to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them all a big round of applause. So as, as we go into the Q&As, you know, I think one of the things that really stood out is the importance from policy to treatment and care down to the personal interaction, and how important it is that we look at how do we connect, how do we communicate. 
And so the question that I'm going to actually ask um, any one of the panel members to answer is part of the challenge that we heard from Dr. Trail was unmet needs and needing an advocate. And so from either one of your perspectives, um, how have you seen the, uh, a creative way in being an advocate? What are the innovative tools that are out there? Or what have you seen that has worked well? I'll go ahead and take start that one if it's okay, ma'am. So uh, yeah, I think so. Again, I'm, I'm going to pull back on this this SFRG because we really we really want this to become that that initial sort of tool or that that initial grab that brings those families and the soldiers completely into that network of that organization, and uh, and it's through the SFRG and the commander being able to routinely just communicate effectively and re and and repetitively to the soldiers and families about what's available, where to get help. Um, you know, here's resources that we're hearing about. I mean, taking this, uh, moving with the military, and 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 pulling that into uh, you know everybody knowledge so that they can see, oh, what a great idea. Here's something I hadn't thought about. But being able to, to bring in all these resources, and there's, there's thousands of agencies out there, both on the installation and off the installation, that can really be pulled into locally as well as uh, regionally that can assist these families. So I, 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 I want to say again, I, I truly see at the foundation, uh, just sort of what, what the uh, Rand was saying, the foundation for family and soldier readiness really begins with commanders establishing strong soldier and family readiness groups. And, and, and being able to routinely, effectively communicate with those families through multiple me mechanisms. And, and I really believe, and I think it was brought up earlier, this idea of social media. We've got, to, we've got to continue to leverage social media and give commanders the tools where they can use social media and it can be effective and not so much uh, be, become a, a place where people are uh, a little anxious to get onto, but really they want to be part of that, that community and get pulled into that community. And I think that's really our... Are, that, that to me is the best way to connect them, yeah. Thank you. And Rob, you know, it's clear your passion, um, and I love that, the heartfelt response that you gave in really caring for the children of our military. And so, having had children when we were both serving on active duty, and the challenge of trying to figure out when is it that it's really a behavior health need, and when is it that it's the natural stress of deployments and separations and so what have you seen from your experience that's a tough question um, I think that anytime you're going to have multiple moves a uh, new school new location it's going to be stressful uh, depending on where the family is and uh, if the family's in stress and especially where usually where mom or the or the caregiver is going to be home where they are emotionally uh, is what's going to impact uh, on the child's transition. Um, it's also uh, developmentally. Uh, young kids may not respond as well, and teenagers, we know we move them away from their friends. I think with the difference between stress and not stress, you look at how the child is, is starting to cope. Are they, uh, or are they more ornery? Uh, is sleep going away? Have you seen a decline in academic performance? Uh, do you sort of have that gut feeling? Uh, that something's not right? Are you responding as a parent maybe a little shorter because you may be picking up on their uh, issue as well? Um, I think listening to your gut on that. And I would also say if you think there's an issue, then there's probably an issue. And get in to see somebody who has a little more objectivity, a professional, who can give you that feedback. Um, you can wait too long, I think, to, to reach out. And I think one of the challenges is that, I was reminded of this in the same meeting I held with some folks, is that many spouses are taught to embrace the suck. And, right? And, and I, I applaud that, and I think that's good, but you can go a little too far and, and wait too long. So it's a tough one, so my guess is that if you think there's a problem, there's, listen to your teachers as well. That's where the problems may first start. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up to the audience and see if there's any questions that are out there, and then if not, I've got some more questions. Yes, ma'am. Here comes Mike. Yeah. 
Then, oh, there it is. Did you hear those questions at all? Yeah, about the size and accommodation and waiting list, right? Yes, okay. and then do you have any, uh, w will the center expand to other states or other areas? Sure. Uh, the second question probably is the easiest to, to answer. The answer to that is probably not. Based on the trust that supports us, um, we need to stay within the Hampton Roads area. That doesn't mean our philosophy and our work won't. Uh, I've recently been having some conversations with the Cohen Veterans Network and of their interest in doing some, uh, some more work uh, and how we may be able to help them in some of their outpatient works going to residential. So again, that's sort of what we look for is partnerships. Uh, bed capacity, we're 72 beds. Uh, we're six 12-bed units that's uh, separated by both gender and age. So there's some limitations we have with that. Um, uh, length of stay, somebody asked that, and if you asked that, that's about six months. Uh, what do we do when we're full? Um, we don't have that often because we have about six months and they're moving forward. But when there's full and people are having to find placement, we have some other partners that we work with that we feel confident with. And it's the same if we say if we get a referral for an eating disorder, because uh, we don't do eating disorders, we will help find that placement for you. Uh, but my team does a great job of, uh, when a parent calls for help, we just don't say we don't have bed space, we don't treat, goodbye. We say we don't have bed space, don't have space, hang on, let us see what we can do, and we walk. Mm -hmm. We've stuck with parents and families two or three months to find the same placement, even though they're not coming to us. Very nice, thank you. Yes, sir. So, hello. Um, this is back to the SFRG uh, information, and I'm the spouse half of a command team currently trying to build a really robust SFRG like you've been describing. Um, and my question is, how is the Army looking at connecting the spouses and providing the information to the commanders so that they can be a conduit of resources, not only Army-provided resources, but off-post organizations as well? Yeah, so I mean, I think that, uh, so that's one of the things that we continue to look at in terms of uh, with working with our uh, partners uh, down at the Installation Management Command. They are preparing to uh, roll out a new virtual family readiness group uh, platform that will help uh, provide commanders, at least provide, have a, a capability to communicate to families using the VFRG, uh, which needed an update and it's getting updated. That's one uh, mechanism. The other is, I mean, I think the, the, the thing that's probably uh, the most viable that we continue to see is, uh, you know, we know that the majority of millennials still use Facebook very heavily and other social media uh, platforms and, and figuring out a way for, you know, helping commanders to give them the information and the tools so that they can utilize that as a platform and then being able to connect the local ACS and what's happening in, at locally at that community, being able to have that as a push to those commanders so it can then push out to the uh, the family members, whether it's through Army Community Services or MWR or, or uh, activities that are happening at the local health healthcare facility, being able to get that information in the hands of commanders as rapidly as possible so they can continue to push that out. Uh, we, we see that truly as part of the implementation portion going forward, and, um, and we recognize there's still some gaps there. But I think that the beginning is if we can ensure that commanders are really bringing in that whole community team, whether it's the, uh, the soldier who's new to the unit, new to the Army, and living in the barracks and not really sure what to do and, and how to get there, or the family members that have, you know, this is their second or third time, but first time in that installation, how they can, we can get them all connected into one, uh, one, one strategy to, or one medium to get information out to them, um, we, we, we do recognize that that's really the key. And, and I think part of it is our implementation as we continue to build this, we want to continue to try to solicit what are the best practices, what's working well and what's not working well, so that we can make sure that we're not putting out information that, that has just been very ineffective and not helpful. Colonel Lewis, can I ask a quick question? How do families tell you what's working well and what's not working well? So we do, um, and part of currently what we've been doing is we've been uh, meeting with stakeholders and other uh, senior leaders to help gather some of that information. But uh, we could, you know, I think this is a great forum uh, for us to get that information and uh, we'll continue to try to resolve that as well. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned all these policy changes or changes that you're working on as far as policy uh, to the soldier family readiness group. Um, when can we expect to see some of these changes? And moving forward, what what's the future look like after these changes get into yeah. place? Thank you very much. So in April, the uh, the Secretary of the Army signed an Army directive that did change the put put in place the change to the Soldier and Family Readiness Group that identified the change to the name, but also um, brought in you know some of the easing the restrictions and the reporting requirements. So that was our first major initiative. We've done a couple. Uh, uh, announcements through the bugle call and army.mil about that change. The second part of it is we recognize as we put out policy that we needed some additional implementing guidance to help uh, inform commanders about the change to the SFRG and, and give them some more left and right boundaries. So that that implementing guidance is, is nearing completion for internal staffing, and we hope to get that out very soon. That'll help inform, again, the field about the change to the SFRG, and we're going to use that uh, that next um, notification, if you will, as a launch pad to then continue to adjust and make iterative changes to policy. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Matthews. Uh, the question I have is, during our Army career, we have been uh, stationed with joint services. So what is the Army doing to help decrease that loneliness when you're stationed with the Air Force or stationed with the Navy, because we've been stationed with them and we've been told, oh, you're Army, we can't do anything for you. Wow, that's a, that one, I, if I could take that for the record, but I can't. So um, let me, I think the important thing is, I, mean, I think that we recognize that still remains to be a gap. And as we're looking at, as we're getting feedback, we've heard a couple times that at joint uh, installations, it, there still needs to be some communication out there to to support the families, but um, I, I, you know that that uh, I think it remains to be a gap, and I'd be glad to hear some more from you. Hello, sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Michelle Burr, and my question is: How is the environmental data being used to isolate what seems like an army issue versus um, the population at whole? So, for example, when I see work-life balance, I think every working woman I know. But if I'm being messaged that this is an army problem and needs an army solution, I just wonder how that shapes people's perception of experiencing work-life balance issues. Same thing with loneliness. We know that millennials and Gen Z are lonelier, more isolated, more social media, less contact. How are we messaging that and looking at it in context? Uh, I don't have the the environmental information, Dr. Trail, you might be able to jump in on this. Um, I will. I will tell you, and I assure you, I don't have to tell you this. That um, when we're talking isolation and loneliness and and work-life balance, uh, yes, it's experienced across the board. But what I think happens is when you add the added stresses of the military life cycle, um, it can it can really exacerbate some of those problems. And I don't know if you all found anything that supported that or. So, yeah, I think um, you raise a very good point. And we didn't survey civilians, right? So we don't, we can't compare like the military families and what they're facing to what civilian families are facing. But I think Patty's absolutely right that the idea is that look, army families have the same problems that every other family has, right? But they have this additional stress of deployments and op ops tempo and all this other stuff going on and moves every two years that exacerbate those problems more likely. Um, so the idea is that, you know, loneliness is a pretty common experience for a lot of millennials now, but if you have to move every two years, if you establish a group of friends, more than likely those moves are gonna exacerbate your loneliness. So the idea is that, you know, to the extent that the Army can have programs and services, things like the SFRGs to help families negotiate that part of Army life, then that's an important you know, service that can be provided that at least, you know, doesn't really say that it's an army problem per se, that being lonely, but that it's a support that's in place to help the army life from exacerbating the common civilian problems. Yeah. And I, I think we're a microcosm of the greater society. And I think there's areas where we're very similar to the stressors that are occurring just in life for everybody in general. 
And um, I think one of the things, a couple of the questions that were raised, I think it really highlights an opportunity for us to actually have a really good feedback loop and to be able to look at how do we take what we have and connect it digitally, right, so that we keep those that are maybe on the joint bases connected to programs that are already really strong within our military. So I just, um, some of it is that there's strength that families when they go through adversity and some of it's a shared experience that actually gives us resiliency and I've seen resiliency you know, in the military children. And so I think a good point is what are the strengths that come out of this and then what are the challenges that come out of this? So we've got a question from the audience, and this is for Colonel Lewis. So what type of training is going to be provided to commanders, especially at the company level, to provide them with the tools they need to be effective leaders of a um, SF, excuse me, SFRG? Will commanders be provided training at their, at their captain's career course, PCC, or at their installations prior to taking command? Thank you. So uh, yeah, so one of the things when we uh, we're, we, we've had a couple work groups associated with the SFRG, and we've been working with uh, TRADOC, who runs the Company Commander First Sergeant Course Curriculum, to begin to look at developing uh, the content that really reinforces the SFRG and, and the changes in the SFRG. But I do want to sort of revert back a little bit um, to what I was highlighting earlier. You know, again, the things that commanders already do and, and command teams, whether it's the commander, the first sergeant, and their, and their subordinate leaders, when they're building those lethal combat teams, I mean, they're, they're doing what, you know, the core leadership elements in terms of being highly competent and knowledgeable and being able to regularly communicate with their soldiers about what that mission is and creating that sense of purpose and, and, and focus for them. Those are the same skills that they really can employ across across their whole formation to the family members and, and to all the soldiers in that organization to talk about the, the, the organization as a, as a fighting force. So while we want to make sure that we're orienting the commanders to their important, vitally important role as SFRG leaders, we're also going to reinforce that they have much, they, they've got a lot of these skills and tools uh, in, in their kit bag already, and that's what made them successful to want to get into the, to, to, to assume the mantle of command, and that will carry them through their command time as well. So. Uh, we, we are working closely, though, with the TRADOC and the Company Commander First Sergeant Course Curriculum folks to help ensure that we build this right for them. And then the second component is then uh, working with our um, the, the folks at the public affairs and the social media so that we can ensure that we're giving them the best information of how to uh, maximize and use social media as a way to help connect and communicate to family members. or MBSR, and I'm wondering if MBSR is one of the tools in the toolbox, both on the military side, the FRG side, and, and of SFRG, um, and in your uh, organization also, on the, on the parent level and the children. Uh, kids can, you know, learn this very young and utilize it through their whole lives, and with the added stress of military life, uh, this is so important. Uh, you know, along with diet and exercise mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, is this being utilized, these stress reduction techniques, MBSR and the like? I'm going to let, where's Deirdre? Do you want to stand up real quick? Because the Army has been doing a lot of work in this, both for family members and for the service members um, since 2012. So I'll let. Yes, and I think it needs to be very holistic. One of the good news is um, we've been looking at mindfulness training, and um, General Pyatt has um, pushed to move mindfulness training out to the force, um, and that's a real recent decision that I think is very exciting because um, we know that students that practice mindfulness have less um, um, it, it, trouble with um, detention and fights, um, especially where they've taken this into inner schools, which is really critical. Um, and so the mindfulness aspect of it and stress reduction techniques, once they're learned, they're lifelong techniques. Um, so yes, it's a very critical component. And it's a matter of not just having the, the training available, but having it available in ways that the families can reach it. So ensuring that there's apps out there that if you don't have time because you're in a busy life, let's not add stress to the life by having another thing you have to go to. Let's bring the training to you, whether it be through YouTube, apps, or other digital mediums so that you can have it when when you need to have access to it. 
So I can't speak um, on ACS right now, but what I will say is what we try to do, um, I, I'm, I'm coming from Schofield Barracks, and what we try to do um, multiple times during the year is you saw in the survey, which I thought was really brilliant, that some of our military families not just want a military solution, but they want the civilian solution also. So I'll use an example of September as Suicide Prevention Month. So what we would set up in September is a whole festival um, of different resources, both military and civilian, to include our ACS partners, where they could bring everything they brought for suicide. We would also do this in the spring called a Festival of Healing um, for um, uh, uh, sexual assault awareness, uh, domestic violence, child mm -hmm. abuse, all those domestic issues, and all the resources there. And so what we try to do is find different community resources and military resources so that we can meet you where you need to be met instead of realizing that a one-size solution won't fit all. Um, but I can't speak, um, unfortunately, on ACS and what they're doing with mindfulness and stress reduction. Um, but what I can speak to is that the MTFs for the Army and ACS use 123 MAGIC as the program together so that if you start off with ACS with children that are having some stress re issues, they, they're starting with a curriculum called 123 MAGIC. And then if they move into a clinical field and it goes to the um, child and family behavioral health clinics, once they go into that, they use the 123 MAGIC curriculum also. So where there's areas of collaboration, we always want to collaborate so that we provide that um, stability regardless of where you go get your resource. You're going to hear um, the best evidence. And again, but making it available in a way that allows us to meet families where they need to be met. Thank you. And I think we have um, used up all of our time. And so I just want to thank the panelists for the strong work that they do each and every day and for the outstanding support that our spouses and our families give our service members. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant General Jorjo, and to our panelists, Colonel Lewis and, and Rob McCarthy, um, McCartney. Uh, you've got a little gift, parting gift from us, and uh, we are going to bring up our next speaker right away because um, I think you really want to hear from this gentleman. Uh, we're very, very proud of him. He's, he's an Army general that is going to be a, a very important person in all of our lives. So we are now going to hear from Lieutenant General Ronald Place, uh, Director of the Defense Health Agency, DHA. Um, which is in uh, Defense Health Headquarters at Falls Church, Virginia. General Place leads a joint integrated combat support agency enabling the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps medical services to provide a medically ready force to combat in commands in both peacetime and wartime. I could go on and on and on about all of his amazing uh, accomplishments, but I think that you'd rather hear from him. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Ron Place. So good afternoon. I'm, my wife's in the back now, or maybe she moved back to the front, but I was kind of hoping, sweetheart, maybe we can get somebody to help us move the furniture at home, just like they did that here. With our kids moving out of the house, now it's all on, on me, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Hey, thanks for being here this afternoon. I have just a couple of images that I want to show you, um, and they describe just what it is that I think about when it comes to the military health system. Now, this is the one I almost always lead off with in my presentation, and, and it's labeled the fog of war. And I think everybody who looks at this sees something specific in it. If you ask us as soldiers, what does that mean? It talks about the uncertainties of what combat looks like. And as a combat surgeon, I can tell you in, in all of my deployments, this is what it looks like. I don't know what's coming in. I don't know how injured they are. I don't know what I'm going to do about it. But we have a team that's going to take care of it. That's the military health system, right? Except only about 20% of what we do in combat is actually combat casualty care. Most of it's something else. It's infectious diseases, it's women's health, it's disease non-battle injury, it's all aspects of behavioral health care. All that also counts as the fog of war. And that's important for our soldiers. It's important for us as we prepare them for combat. It's important for our medical teams as they're deployment ready to be able to take care of that. Can we all agree to that? Seriously, can we all agree to that? Okay. That said, that's not what this conference is about, though, is it? This conference is about the families who support those soldiers. That's what this is about. And how many of you, as family members supporting your soldiers, feel like the military health system is kind of a fog of war? 
Now you're giggling about that. I can tell you, I've traveled to dozens of locations over the last couple of years, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and even some Coast Guard locations, and the number one challenge, complaint, issue, you pick the adjective, that I hear in, in terms of our military health system is, you guys don't have a system. Because when I go to make an appointment at one location, it's different than when I try to make it at another location. Is it better to do it online? Is it better to call the clinic? Is it better to call the, the one number? How does that work? What about when I get a referral? Who handles that? Do I do it? Do you do it? How long do I wait? Who calls me? Do I have to take something with me when I go out, or do they call me? What about after I'm seen? Do I bring it back? Do they bring it back? How does that work? Yes? So we don't have a system. So when I talk about the fog of war, at least for this particular audience, the number one objective in the Defense Health Agency for the coming year or two would be to figure out how do we get from where we are right now, which is local solutions, where people tried very, very hard to solve a problem locally because somebody had an issue with it, to a standardized system where it makes sense. This is how you make appointments. This is how we interact with our contract partners in the purchase care sector. This is how the information gets to them, not on your back to carry it there. This is how the information gets back to us, not on your back to bring it back to us. How can that system work to remove that fog? Because here's the deal, that's personal for me. Now, every single one of you, it's personal. This is how it's personal for me. That's my beautiful bride on, on the right. And between us, is, is our daughter. And while I was, I was nervous and, and afraid at times in my multiple combat deployments, and I'm confident that my family was a little bit worried about me, nothing was more challenging to me than when my daughter was in Afghanistan. That's my child. But the fact of the matter, every single soldier who's deployed is somebody's, right? There's somebody's child, there's somebody's husband, there's somebody's wife, and it's important, it is critically important to them. That handsome young man in the middle is my baby. Now he's 26 and 6'2 and 195 pounds now, but he's still my baby. And that little guy in there is, is our second grandchild of five, and our daughter is pregnant with then second child, now pregnant with third child. That's the military health system, right? Because we have to take care of that combat casualty care part. But we are honored and truly blessed to be able to take care of that. And we could put 500,000 family photos up there, and every single one of them are just as important, at least to me, as that family photo. Because the fact of the matter is, when it comes to, to health care, let's go to the stage this morning. And what did the chief do? He did this, right? He had a group of about 40 young men and women who said, I'm with you. I'm on your team. And the fact of the matter is, we recruit soldiers, but we retain families. So this is just the first step of the process, at least the way that I understand it. What you're looking for from us collectively, whether it's in the Defense Health Agency, Army Medicine, Navy Medicine, Air Force Medicine, what you're looking for for us is how can this system support that individual service member and the families who are around them. One of the things that we're blessed with in, uh, in the DHA and in TRICARE is there's no shortage of people who have an opinions about what we do. <clears throat> but I'll give you this. So we monitor an account that has anything to do with TRICARE. And this post happened just a, a couple of weeks ago. And this, again, not being an unemotional topic, it was rapidly followed <laughs> with hundreds of additional posts. And some of them are here. I'll wait a moment if, if you want to read some of them. And it went on, and it went on. Now, not all of them were positive, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you saw some of them that were on there that, in fact, weren't positive. But the majority, in fact, a huge majority of them, we're positive. That's the importance, that's the value that the military health system brings to our young men and women. And it's a responsibility that we don't take lightly. So I'm not here to tell you that the military health system is perfect. And in fact, of the matter, we know that it's not. But what we also know is that iteratively, it gets better every day, every week, every month, and every year. 
And the reason for that is every single leader in the military health system, well, whether still in it or retired, like General Horojo, or my battle buddy, I'm not sure if he walked in, but uh, General Dingell, the, the new Surgeon General, we are universally aligned in the idea that what we do matters to you. Now that's my overall belief in our system. If you go to the last chart, we also have a booth downstairs where we can answer lots and lots and lots of questions, in particular about TRICARE related issues. I have a few experts in the room with me who can help me for things that I won't necessarily know the answer to, but I'm open to any and all questions and comments that you might have. Way in the back, yes ma'am. I heard the accountability word, but most of the rest of it I didn't hear, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What is the accountability uh, program for keeping our providers up to date, like the list up to date for who manages our health care? Sure. Um, well, in, in, in all honesty, that's a relationship we have with our TRICARE contractors. Um, depending on the areas, they are more current than others. One of the challenges that we face in all of our TRICARE contracts is, is how open exactly is that particular provider to our beneficiaries. In some cases, it's limited uh, based on a week or a month's worth. In some, they have wide variability. All that we really know from our contractors is that they're willing to be partners with us. That said, uh, in the development of our next TRICARE contract, based on that particular complaint that we've received, um, we are in dialogue with uh, the different managed care support contractors who may be bidding on our next contract on how we can further ensure the accountability of are they willing to treat our patients or not? Is it an up-to-date list or not? When we call to make appointments with those providers, are they available or not? So we are aware it's a current challenge. I think that's what you're referring to and how are we can improve it with the next uh, TRICARE contract. Did that get to your question? Thanks, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, good I'd afternoon. like to make just a comment. I think it's kind of uh, good news. I was at Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii and as a soldier um, going through retirement process um, and decompressing from active duty, whenever I walked through that hospital, everyone took the opportunity to uh, help me get from place to place as I was um, kind of uh, in a zombie state of, of transition. So I just want to say that whoever put that strategy into place uh, reduced my uh, stress on a on a visit by visit occasion. So I just want to say thank you. Well, wonderful. I appreciate the comment. We'll make sure that Colonel Krieger, I, I don't know if she's here or not, but we'll make sure she gets that feedback. Sir, it's Patty. Yeah, Patty. Um, I was in Germany about three weeks ago, and I promised them that I would ask you this question. So it's their question. Uh, in Germany, especially, getting care off post in the civilian sector can be challenging because of the you know, language barrier and whatnot. But one of the other big challenges that seems to be happening there is getting diagnostic tests read in a timely manner so that it comes back to maybe the, the clinic and, and the physicians on, on uh, post. Um, what can you tell us about maybe why that might be an issue, and is there any um, forward thinking about how you can solve it? Sure, Patty, thank that's a great question. It's twofold. Uh, the first of it is, uh, do they get read? And the second, almost all of them, uh, irrespective of the country, you're bringing up Germany, but could be any of the countries uh, around the world that our, our managed care support contractor overseas uh, facilitates, it's, it's actually the translation that's the, the rate limiting step for most of those. Um, it's one thing to need translation uh, capability, but it's another to have specific medical knowledge and translation capability, and the number of companies that do that is actually relatively limited. So it's not actually the reading. As long as we'd be willing to take them in German or stationed in Italy, in Italian, et cetera, we could get them very, very quickly. It's the translation. So what we're working through with our next, again, overseas TRICARE contract is where's the time limits that go not just in the reading but in the translation capability and then a requirement to get those clear and legible reports back into the military health system. So right now our current contract doesn't describe all of those steps. The request for proposals we have for the overseas contracts does have all those steps in it with rate limiting time uh, steps in them to be able to address that problem. Thanks for the question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you help us understand what is the communication strategy for 
we, we know it's a fast moving train, lots of things are happening. What's the communication strategy from your level to us out here who are beneficiaries of the system? How, how do we know what to expect and sort of when? Sure, well, let me tell you the first thing, what you should expect in the, in the short term is that everything will look exactly as it looks now. This, this, all the transformation of the military health system from Army medicine and Navy medicine and Air Force medicine to collective military health system, defense health agency medicine should be invisible to all of you. It, it just keeps on, keeps on going on. But from a transparency, let me tell you what's happening in, behind the scenes. And it starts with that standardization that I just mentioned. The standardization of how we do our administrative processes. When it comes to going to the pharmacy, should it be the same methodology? I mean, shouldn't you know whether you're supposed to go to the window or not, get a ticket or not, two tickets, why two tickets? I don't know. I mean, how many of you lived through that? So from a, so from a, a communications practice, I'm telling you, we're not telling our providers, this is the way you must practice. That's not the goal of all this. Now, there are some, what we call them CPGs, clinical practice guidelines, that describe exactly how in some particular conditions the way we ought to do stuff. And managing our clinical staff so they actually do that is a goal of ours. But most importantly is how do we set up the system so that it supports all of you? So when Dr. Trail is talking about, hey, this military culture thing, we don't understand it. The military system thing, we don't understand it. Yeah, we're part of the problem. And so I'm just telling you, don't worry about it's going to look different when I walk into this Army hospital or this Navy hospital. And ma'am, to your question earlier, man, it's the same thing for healthcare, right? You try to walk into an Air Force clinic and you're an Army beneficiary, they tell you, hey, not here. We're not taking care of you. What kind of crap is that? Right? It's a military health system. It's supposed to take care of the entire Department of Defense. So if you look at the way that we're organizing our systems, it doesn't matter what kind of beneficiary you are. It doesn't matter what your, your home service is. When you walk into one of our treatment facilities, it shouldn't matter, and we'll take care of you. So when I talk about what the process is for the next uh, couple of years or so, that's what I'm talking about. So don't be worried about what are they breaking, what are they taking away. We're not doing any of that. We are standardizing our systems to better support all of you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it sounds to me like you're standardizing the processes, the logistics, taking the ticket, who to call, when, you know, that kind of thing. But what about the actual medical uh, diagnoses or procedures? Say I'm at Tripler and I'm told that I can do an MRI in lieu of a mammogram but then before that happens, I have to transfer to Fort Hood, and then I'm told at Fort Hood, oh no, you can't get an MRI, you, you know. Yeah. Eh. So that fits into the same category as far as I'm concerned. That's business rules. Now one of the things, and, and we've, in the military health system, we've, we've lost sight of this in some, there's supposed to be a, a unified medical program, which means that if you can get it on post, you should be able to get it off post. And if you get it off post, you should be able to get it on post, right? So a unified medical plan would say, this is the way we do stuff. So I'm not just talking about that, I'm talking about exactly that sort of thing. What's the program, what's the plan, what's the thought process, what's the algorithm that delivers each of those benefits that all of you have earned? That's in the bucket, ma'am. I'm on your side. I have two things. Um, one is thank you. Uh, you know, I look back on the last 11 years and we have friends who had children, uh, you know, in civilian hospitals that had to take out loans <laughs> for that. And um, my first son cost $5 and my second son cost 10 <laughs> for us. So it's pretty amazing. Um, but then I look at some of our, our friends, uh, one in particular who actually just PCS'd to this area, whose daughter was diagnosed with autism, was on a really good program. And when they moved here, then had to defend that diagnosis. Drive two hours to get paperwork to only be dropped off at a, a specific place, who then, when they got there, weren't there. And, you know, they were so grateful that they were to be able to get to a place where uh, the diagnosis was made and they were on a plan. And then the systems don't talk. And I know, I'm sure you've covered that, and I think it has a lot to do with this last um, question. And so, um, are the, I think the doctors and nurses and the administrative staff, are they aware that when a diagnosis is coming in from as, you know, in a PCS that, okay, maybe we should connect with them or are they just saying, okay, we have to research this and we have to do our own testing here to make sure that what was done before was correct? Um, thanks for the question, ma'am. So the first, I'll say that your, your babies didn't cost you five and $10. They cost you your family's service. 
which is, right, it's hard to measure that. So I, I thank you for the, com for the compliment. That's not really the way I see it. I see it's the cost of your service. Uh, but to the second question, one of the challenges that we really have, though, is that <clears throat> states control many of the, 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 the certifications, qualifications, et cetera, to who delivers what sort of care. And autism is one that's particularly unique, and there's wide variability across the United States. So within the military health system, we have a relative requirement uh, across that. But if, if you go, to, in particular, civilian providers, in one state, it's different than in another state. And so if, if, uh, if a particular state, state A, requires this lower level of certification and, and the family is thrilled with the care that they're giving, but then they move to another state that has a higher level of certification, they'll say, sorry, we're not going to accept that because it doesn't reach our level of certification. We have to do it over again. So some of the challenges that we face is how can we set a standard across the entire military health system that allows each of us to have enough capacity and capability to see what we need outside in the civilian system and still have it be transportable. I don't have a perfect solution to that. Autism is a great example of the challenges that we face. It's not the only example, but we, we try to balance both of those requirements. Is there enough to, to meet the requirements of the community and still be portable once that family moves around? Does that get to your point? Thank you. Well, thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, and, and if there's any other questions that any of you may have, please stop down in the booth and see us, uh, whether it's me or other members of the military health system, we'd be glad to answer your, your questions. Thanks again. Lieutenant General Place, thank you. That, uh, you know, I, I was thinking that I, next year we're going to need to do a medical panel. I think that that, that is in order because there's so much um, to talk about. And I think that would be great. So we'll be in touch. <laughs> All right. So we have uh, one last panel to go. And it actually, it really is a great uh, connection to what we just heard. Because this is all about self-care and uh, resiliency and building resiliency physically, mentally, and, and spiritually. And so um, I'm going to ask you all to take another stretch break in place. Don't go anywhere. Because like I said, this is the longest one. I promise you that tomorrow they'll be a little bit shorter. But uh, I think you're in for a, a real treat with some of the um, conversations that we're going to have in just a few minutes. <laughs>